taking action for you. This morning on TV 20 Detroit. Stop. The presidential election was one for the books. As I stand in front of one of the polling sites in Detroit at Wayne County Community College District's Curtis L. Ivory Health and Wellness Education Center, I focus on the health and wellness of a community. And the word community is utterly important because there is no unity without community. So on this episode of Post Speak with Greg Dunmore, we're going to focus on the importance of unity in the community as we move forward. And we know that the universal language of love is music. So join us as we talk about the importance of moving forward, unity in the community, as only we like to do it on Post Beat with Greg Dunmore. What do you want them to know coming from the perspective of a father, distinctively a black father? Um, hey, just honor what they say. Honor what you say you're going to do. Be there for whatever you're, um, just be there for the people that you propose to represent. I would like the leadership in Washington to not leave the poor people behind, besides the middle class and the upper class. There's the poor people that depend on their food stamps monthly. I would like for them to evaluate that because the cost of, of the economy is so high right now, it would, it would do us much better if they would give the, the poor people more food stamps so they can feed their families. What I want um, Mr. Trump to think about, I need him to think about bringing everybody together instead of splitting us apart. That's what he needs to do. That's what I would like to see him do. Because the issue of him uh, stating that if he doesn't get chosen as president, it's going to be hell to pay. Really? It's going to be hell for who? I'm, I'm shocked at our country. And um, I, I just hope and I pray that we can uh, go beyond the division that Donald Trump has created. Um, I was hopeful that with Harris, we could be more united. Um, I don't know if that's the case. It is, it is shocking, quite honestly, that so many people will vote for Donald Trump, um, given his history, um, given him being impeached, given the um, uh, trouble that he's been in and with the with the law um given his outlandish statements that he makes regularly thoughtlessly um so unfortunately you know we we pulled we went hard in michigan um i think in michigan um the people were clear that kamala is our president um and was our, our selected leader and if this is the outcome um, you know, we're just going to do the best that we can. President Donald Trump, he is now the president. And I know that you walk along the river and you receive inspiration. So I need for you now to say something to this audience concerning what you would like the incoming president, Donald Trump, to hear from your heart, soul, and intellect regarding expectations as he will be the president in 2025. So President Donald Trump being president in 2025, I want him to open his heart, open his mind, and for his supporters to actually take down the race barriers and take down all of the negativity and turn it into love. And I think if we had, if everybody comes together and also 
looking out for our seniors, looking out for our children, and looking out for our history, looking out for things that I want all of us to learn about, to know about. All of our young people need to know their history. And that means whether you're black, whether you're white, no matter what. So if President Donald Trump is gonna be president in 2025, we need to know that he is actually gonna have an open heart and an open mind to making sure he's inclusive. I know he doesn't believe in DNI, DEI. He doesn't believe in that. But we have to still have unity, no matter what, of coming together and learning about each other and learning about, instead of our differences, learning about what we have as one. Well, I think the first thing that has to happen is a sincere effort, a methodical strategic effort to get Americans to understand that we're all in this thing together. And there's been so much energy put into um, nurturing the divisiveness and the differences of, of Americans that it's really hurt the country over this uh, cycle. And we're standing in front of Wayne County Community College District's downtown campus, and we know that there is no community without the word unity. So can you speak to that? There is no community without unity and what that means, especially for the nation as we're going through this very difficult time. You know, I think that unfortunately, we are who we are. And depending on the outcome of the election, we will see whether or not those people who have demonstrated so much passionate disrespect for people of color will go back into their corners and their closets where they've been for a long time. What you have to understand is that Donald Trump made um, racist, racist people feel comfortable with who they are. And that is why we've seen so much of the madness, January 6th and all of that. But you know what, in the final analysis, the king has it in his hand. He left us a book to believe in. Oh, yes, he did. I love teaching others because when I first got into the healthcare field, People overlooked me. I was really a ninth grade dropout who had no education, but I was determined to make something of myself for my baby. So Motor City Match matched the funds I put into my business. They awarded me $20,000. So now I'm able to focus solely on first step healthcare training and give it everything it needs. All because I live in Detroit. If you like what we're doing, please tell a friend. Or if you want to see what we've done again, go to postbeatglobal.com. That's P-U-L-S-E-B-E-A-T-G-L-O-B-A-L.com. You can also go to our Postbeat TV YouTube channel and you can revisit what we're doing. And once again, you can tell everybody that we're doing something that is so exciting that they wouldn't want to miss it. Remember postbeatglobal.com or the YouTube channel Postbeat TV. Thanks for telling the world about us. Postbeat. When the NABJ, the National Association of Black Journalists, invited Donald Trump to its 2024 National Convention in Chicago, it was a polite thing to do. And the first thing out of Donald Trump's mouth was how insulted he was by the rudeness of the NABJ conversation interview that is still being discussed as one for the books. Moreover, Donald Trump knows a lot about what it means to be rude and crude. You've attacked black journalists, calling them a loser, saying the questions that they ask are, quote, stupid and racist. You've had dinner with a white supremacist at your Mar-a-Lago resort. So my question, sir, why should black voters trust you after you have used language like that? Well, first of all, I don't think I've ever been asked a question so in, in such a horrible manner, a first question. <laughs> you don't even say, hello, how are you? Are you with ABC? Because I think they're a fake news network, a terrible network. And 
I think it's disgraceful that I came here in good spirit. So uh, your take on what took place during this interview with um, Donald Trump at the NABJ convention 2024 in yeah. Chicago. Yeah, but we just witnessed was an abomination. Uh, we knew exactly who he was. Uh, we knew exactly how he was going to lie. Uh, out of the gate, he insults NABJ. He insults Ra Rachel Scott. Uh, this is a man who has consistently attacked black journalists. He's attacked journalists. He attacked Jamel Hill. He attacked. Um, he attacked. Uh, April Ryan. He attacked Yamiche El Sindor, who was sitting in the audience. You've said repeatedly that you think that some of the equipment that governors are requesting, they don't actually need. You said New York might need, I, not, I might not need thirty thousand. You said it on I Sean Hannity's on. Fox News. You said you know, that why you don't, might. Why don't you some, people act? Let, let me ask you. You said why some don't state, you act, Why don't you act in a little more positive? It's always trying to my get question you. to you. Get is, you. Get you. And you know what? That's why nobody trusts the media anymore. My That's question why to you is, how is that going to impact? Excuse me, you didn't hear me. That's why you used to work for the Times, and now you work for somebody else. Uh, and so what we got is exactly what many of us knew we were going to get. Mr. Trump repeatedly evaded all questions that were asked. Every time Rachel, Harris, or Kadia asked a question, he would first insult each of them. It, was, it always opened up with an insult, and then he wouldn't directly answer the question. And if he did, he would just go back to all of his previous talking points that he typically goes to throughout his entire campaign. Throughout the world, world history, the greatest leaders, some of the greatest leaders in the world were in their 80s. But here's the question. Would you consider stepping down if you felt that your health was declining? Or would oh, you, absolutely. And who would make, I think I'd know. How would you make that decision? I think I'd know. Look, if I came onto a stage like this and I got treated so rudely as this woman treated me. Oh, my goodness. Me, and I'm fine with it because she, it does it. She was very rude, sir. Very rude. That was a nasty, that wasn't a question. She sir, didn't ask me a question. question. She gave a statement. That wasn't a question. I, I repeated your statement, the question. sir, actually. This is a person and a personality that we have seen is waiting to be outraged at the first turn when something hard is asked, when something um, challenging asked, when a challenging personality asks him something, and frankly, when a black person asks him something. So it wasn't a matter of necessarily how the question was asked, but at what point was he going to pull the outrage um, trump card, if you will, out of his pocket. Interestingly and insightfully, Donald Trump summed up his chances of winning to what many might conclude as a popularity contest based on his election, depending on whether voters like him or dislike him. But you're not voting that way. You're voting for the president. You're voting for me. If you like me, I'm going to win. If you don't like me, I'm not going to win. Donald Trump has won the state of Wisconsin, which means he is the winner of this race. He is now the second president in U.S. history to win non-consecutive terms. I will not let you down. America's future will be bigger, better, bolder, richer, safer, and stronger than it has ever been before. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. You ready to put your podcast on iHeartRadio? Yes, your podcast on iHeartRadio. What about Alexa, Roku, Fire Stick, Apple TV, Android, or iPhone? Plus live TV streaming. Get your podcast seen and heard all over the world. Call 313-868-6612. Pre-recorded shows are accepted to be archived. This is a WHPR distribution platform. Download the app from the App Store. Go to WHPRTV.com. Channels available for lease 24-7 on Roku. Cool Fire Stick or Apple TV. Coming soon with subscription and pay per view. Also, block time is available. Get yours. Call 313 868 6612. That's 313 868 6612. Executive producer RJ Watkins. Program director Henry Tyler. 107.5 FM WGPR HD2. Radio We Can See.com. Me. Donald Trump and his will. Donald Trump way said that undocumented Mexicans were taking away black jobs. And when asked to define black jobs, he said any job a black person has is a black job. Now, is that what he really meant? But one of the big problems and a lot of the journalists in this room I know and I have great respect for, a lot of the journalists in this room are black. I will tell you that coming, coming, 
from the border are millions and millions of people that happen to be taking black jobs. You had the best. What exactly is a black job, sir? A black job is anybody that has a job. That's what it is, anybody that has a job. All right. Hmm. I can remember when I was in college and I shared a bathroom with a white person and I talked about cleaning the bathroom and we would take turns doing it. He boldly told me that's a black person's job. Now, a black job, that could mean a noble janitor as well as a scholar, be it a doctor, lawyer, or scientist. Jobs in agriculture, construction, landscaping, cleaning, and who's bussing tables at restaurants, washing dishes, cooking? This is the April with the logo. This man, whom we've decided not to name, has worked in restaurants for 20 years since slipping across the desert from Mexico. A couple of restaurants in Manhattan. Also, uh, I used to work in the airport, JFK. Catering for American Airlines. In 2008, he moved up to Trump National Westchester Golf Club. I would say 30% of the employees, maybe, maybe more. In the grounds, kitchen, waste stuff, maintenance, we're pretty much all over the club, illegal people. And Mr. they're, taking, President, they're taking the employment away from black people. They're coming in and they're coming in, they're invading. It's an invasion of millions of people, probably 15, 16, 17 million people. I have a feeling it's much more than that. These people are coming into our country and they're taking black jobs and Hispanic jobs. And frankly, they're taking union jobs. Unions are being very badly affected by all of the millions of people that are pouring into our country. And one thing, as we, as we discussed, Many of these people are coming in from mental institutions, from prisons, from jails. They're gang members in other countries. Other countries are setting loose their prisoners. They're opening up their prisons and their mental institutions, and they're taking their, their bad people, uh, drug dealers, uh, gang members, and they're bringing them into the United States. All and right. by the way, their crime rate is going down and our crime rate is going to be a disaster. Mr. President. And Donald knows a lot about this. He used undocumented labor to build the Trump Tower. He underpaid undocumented workers, and when they complained, he basically said what a lot of employers do. You complain, I'll get you deported. I want to get everybody out of the shadows, get the economy working, and not let employers like Donald exploit undocumented workers, which hurts them, but also hurts American workers. What do you do on day one? What's your first thing? What do I do? Uh, I close the border. And I do two things, because I can do a lot of things simultaneously. I close the border. We don't want people coming. We want people to come in, Harris, but they have to be vetted. They have to be checked. They have to come in legally. We want Legal, people. I want yeah. people to come into our country, but they have to be vetted. They have to be checked. So when you say, what do I do? That, and I drill, baby, drill. I bring energy way down. I bring interest rates down. I bring inflation way down so people can buy bacon again, so people can buy a ham sandwich again, so that people can go to a restaurant and afford it. Because right now, people can't buy food. Your grocery bills are up 40, 50, 60 percent, right? She's agreeing to me. Oh, she's agreeing. Thank you. I like you very much. Uh, <laughs> Mr. President, I think we are. But, but, it's, but it's true. Your grocery bills are up. And then they're mandating that you buy an all-electric car. You know, Elon Musk endorsed me, and he's a friend of mine. He's a good guy, he's a smart guy. But I'm against all, everybody having an electric car, okay? I'm very much against that. You have to be able to, if you want a hybrid or if you want a gasoline propelled car. But, you know, we have more liquid gold, gasoline, oil, under our feet than any other country. More than Saudi Arabia, more than Russia, more than any other country. I want to use it. I want to use what we have I want to bring down prices, bring down costs, and I also have to stop the invasion. And remember, they're taking your jobs. These people coming in are taking your jobs. It was an honor to do it with journalists. It's an important, important day. We hear from everybody. And do you think the first question was rude? I couldn't hear any of the questions. We had audio tech, so I was bummed about that. But I could tell from answers back and forth that there was some tension there. Um, but there was, you know, there was going to be that. But yeah, when the president said he couldn't hear things, and I said I couldn't hear things, and Kadia and Rachel were struggling, we're lucky we got it on today. They were, they were having some tech issues. So I felt blessed with that part. 
Okay. Thank you so All right, much we got to run. Guys. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. To advise Donald Trump to address black America, if you could get his ear um, to address black Americans as American Negroes, because you love that term. Say yes, that, yes, American Negroes, I think absolutely, because again, one thing that I'm pushing is ethnicity. We're done with flat blackness, because when you have flat blackness, you get people like Kamala and Barack Obama who come in and say that they're black, and then black people think, oh, we have a black person who's going to do things for black people, but these people don't belong to our community, and they don't authentically understand what we need. Over the 107 days of this campaign, we have been intentional about building community and building coalitions, bringing people together from every walk of life and background, united by love of country with enthusiasm and joy in our fight for America's future. And we did it with the knowledge that we all have so much more in common than what separates us. A fundamental principle of American democracy is that when we lose an election, we accept the results. That principle, as much as any other, distinguishes democracy from monarchy or tyranny. And anyone who seeks the public trust must honor it. At the same time, in our nation, we owe loyalty not to a president or a party, but to the Constitution of the United States. As I said, this presidential election was one for the books, and there were many lessons to be learned. We'll be right back. Because I live in Detroit, I was able to get tuition-free college through the Detroit Promise. I feel very fortunate working with the Detroit Promise. They were able to afford me so many opportunities. I'm currently studying media production and journalism at University of Michigan Dearborn. I'm looking to take my talents further into the production industry, uh, short films. I love working with people here and this is where I wanna be. And that's why I'm Detroit for life. Addiction is an epidemic. Millions are struggling and over a hundred lives are lost each day. Are you next? At Better Addiction Care, we understand the devastating impact of drug and alcohol addiction. Our network of treatment centers are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's time to fix the pieces addiction has destroyed. Our network of treatment centers offer detox, therapy, counseling, private luxurious centers, physical fitness, chef prepared meals, aftercare, and your insurance may cover up to 100% of costs. Only you can put an end to your addiction. It's time to make the life-changing call and get the help you need. Call now, and in just minutes, you could be on your way to a drug and alcohol-free life. The call is free and confidential, and there is no obligation. Visit betteraddictioncare.com or call. Call 855-246-6872. That's 855-246-6872. There's something about politics and entertainment that sometimes cross. And there's a fascinating tidbit about Jennifer Holliday as it relates to her political influence behind that very powerful voice. Love is so hard to find. But I'm so happy, baby. I'm so happy. Although I mentioned this little known fact on your show way back when, when super singer Jennifer Holliday um, told me this, when I asked her who most influenced her powerhouse singing style, she said it was this Lady Dynamo with the regal and distinctive oratory that most inspired her sound as a singer. Today I am an inquisitor and hyperbole would not be fictional and would not overstate the solemnness that I feel right now. My faith in the Constitution is whole, it is complete, it is total. And I am not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution. Barbara Jordan, and can you imagine, Jennifer Holliday told me, and I thought she was going to say Aretha Franklin or another singer, she said that I sing 
in the way that I would imagine Barbara Jordan, based on that regal speaking voice, would have sounded had she been a singer. You well know all of the urban ills and problems are telescoped in the 18th Congressional District of Houston, Texas. We've got the poverty extremes. Uh, we have a tri-ethnic population. Uh, we have a district which will lend itself quite well to a hard-working, functioning member of Congress. And I want to be a servicing member of Congress. Unknown fact, the great Barbara Jordan inspiring Jennifer Holliday as a singer. in entertainment with Greg Dunmore. The now late, great Quincy Jones, music icon, genius. He's smiling from heaven above and who is also smiling is a man that knew him well, Ron Carter. Stay tuned as Mr. Ron Carter revisits moments that were very special to him regarding Quincy Jones. So share some things that are coming from your heart and soul because you worked for many, many years for the iconic Quincy Jones and some things that you think this audience needs to know that they will only know if they hear it from your mouth to their ears. Yeah. The man that I know is a wonderful, wonderful man. I love him. You know, I wish that I could be around that man every day. Not because of who, his, his, who he is, because that's written in stone. That's going on in the history and the annals of this world. Not only this country, but this world. But I love being around him because he made me feel good. And he made me feel like I was doing something special because he's always doing something special. Now, when you say he was very giving, I can actually <laughs> confirm that. I was over the late great Lionel Hampton's home and he needed $50,000 for a philanthropic situation. Right. He said, let me call Q. And he called him on the phone I'm in his den. He said, I need $50,000. And Quincy Jones told him, it will be FedEx to you. You'll get it tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, that's who he was, you know, because he's gone through hard times. You know, being stuck in Europe when he was a younger man with a band and don't know how to get them back to America. Had to come back to America, get a job at Mercury Records as a vice president of A&R so he can raise money, make money, and send for all those people that was left back there in Europe. That's the kind of, that's Quincy Jones, you know? The guy that says, okay, we, we, we're gonna do something for this world. We're gonna do a, a, a record called We Are The World, and I'm gonna call all my friends, all my celebrity friends, who are great singers, great individuals, and bring them in, and we're gonna do a song, and the song is gonna be a hit song, and they're gonna donate the money to help this world, you know? That's the Quincy Jones that I know. And I don't know what other people know. I, I can't say they don't know that. But what I know of this man is that he's a great man. So